Unions build. Roads, bridges, and buildings. Yes. But with training and apprenticeship programs, unions build much more. A safer community, careers without crushing debt, and a route to rebuild the American middle class. Unions build the future. And we're just getting started. Join us. Today on Built to Last, a landmark in decline. There's a uh, moss where the world's been leaking for 15 years. Choosing to help. I was never expecting to help somebody else. And mixing it up with the trades. Different kind of races, different cultures. Pick up a hammer. It's time for Built to Last. Built to Last is brought to you by the Chicago Regional Council of Carpenters Labor and Management Committee and Armstrong Ceilings. Faster, easier, better. Welcome to Built to Last. I'm Mark Nilsson. And I'm Monica Peterson. We're here at the Chicago Regional Council of Carpenters Apprenticeship and Training Center. It's right here where apprentice carpenters learn to bring old buildings back to life. In our first story, the efforts of skilled labor is breathing life back into an historic building that was once used to save countless lives of people from neighboring communities. It was very impressive. It had these columns, uh, very classical, and then it gradually expanded as the population of Chicago grew. So it became bigger and bigger, and at one time it was the only game in town, really and it was really the place to educate doctors. I came to Cook County in 1965 and I was chief of nephrology, which is kidney disease, until 2008. And even by the time I came to county, most of the physicians and surgeons in Chicago had been trained at county. And they were very proud of their training and they called themselves county men. 1975 budget cuts and a strike among interns and residents closed the hospital and left the building abandoned. From there, time took its toll and the building began to decay. Today, the original Cook County Hospital is being renovated as a privately funded mixed-use development. The whole neighborhood is excited about this project. There's been a lot of news people here. There's been ghost hunters here wanting to come inside, asking me, have you seen anything? Is there anything up there? They want to walk through the job. I, of course, I can't let them. This here is the first floor. Over the last 100 years, they've remodeled this thing umpteen times. Plan to this is going to be a Hyatt Hotel. Uh, there's going to be some Cook County office space on the west side. And then the rest of it, I believe, is 280 Hyatt rooms. You can see a lot of the old plaster work up here. It's all getting redone. We're knocking down anything that was not original. We're replacing all the old original plaster back to where it was in 1913. And all the floors are staying. They're totally restoring all the terrazzo floors. All right, uh, let me take you out front and show you the terracotta. It's really a, a cool aspect of this job. In the exterior of the building, it's all being replaced where it was in the original state in 1913. Uh, certain terracotta over the years, it gets uh, compromised, cracked, broken. They're all being sent out to uh, a company in California to get remolded, remade, to match the exact same color as it was when it was originally built. So when these pieces come in, it's all going to match like it was never even taken out or broken originally. You just don't see this every day in Chicago. I'm really happy to be part of it. Okay, let's go in the lift and back inside to continue the tour. This is the fifth floor. All the walls you see, the clay tile walls, everything gets removed, with the exception of the exterior walls, so it's just gonna be a shell. Back in the day, they used to build with the, with the clay tile. You can see some of it's deteriorated. There's uh, moss where the water and roof's been leaking for 15 years. A lot of this is gonna get tore out. We're gonna report it with concrete, just to stabilize the building. This will be the main corridor to the hotel room. Uh, 
All right, and see this is an active demolition floor. This here is the fifth floor. You gotta use lightweight bobcats because of the clay tile floor. Uh, we can't have more than 3,000 pounds just because of the clay tile won't be able to handle the weight. Just tearing the walls down, dumping them down elevator shaft, directly in the dumpster to pull them out and go. On the side over here, I'm taking out the outside wall and pushing it right into a dumpster also. So when this building's complete, it'll be just a replica of what it was. When this was an open hospital back 100 years ago, they had two large operating theaters. This was a, a teaching hospital back in the day. Matter of fact, wherever we're standing, there'd be someone getting, having surgery, active surgery, by everyone would be up here sitting, watching. I've heard they were very large. Um, they were not air conditioned. They had to keep the windows open in the summer. And uh, the story has it that the nurses used to run around uh, to, uh, with swatters to, to get rid of the flies in these large operating theaters. As a carpenter, just seeing how things were made over 100 years ago is amazing. I'm a history buff. I love doing the rehabs of these jobs. It's turning something old into new, seeing how it was built before, and seeing how to put it back together is really kind of exciting. These two gentlemen did not turn a blind eye. They decided to help. That's the big adjective in training, deciding to help. At Armstrong Ceiling and Wall Solutions, we take great pride in making a positive difference in the lives of people. With the broadest portfolio in the industry and the technical performance to back it up, you can design and install with confidence. Our ceiling construction expertise, training, and pre-engineered ceiling solutions make it easy for you to seamlessly transition from one end of the building to the other. Improve construction efficiencies and keep every job on time, on budget, and on the mark with Armstrong Ceiling and Wall Solutions. Faster, easier, better. When you need a concrete contractor for your commercial project, you can't waste time waiting through countless unproven contractors who don't specialize in the job type you need or service your area. ConcreteIL.com lets you browse Northern Illinois' top contractors to find the perfect fit for your exact needs. You can filter our vetted list of contractors by both job type and location and even request proposals directly through the site. Thinking commercial concrete? Think ConcreteIL.com. From bridges and trains to iconic high-rises, have you ever wondered who's powering Chicago? Power Unlike our sports heroes, they go unnoticed. Yet they proudly keep our businesses, homes, and great city running. IBEW Local 134 electricians and the electrical contractors have the experience, training, and reliability to keep Chicago open for business. Whether it's about safe work practices or emergency training, you'll never know when or if you'll need to use it. But if you do, like the tradesman in our next story, you'll be happy you took the time to learn it. Safety is why we're here today. As you all know, on August 17th, uh, one of our electricians, Kevin McLaughlin, uh, accidentally came into contact with energized uh, cables. Kevin was uh, on the floor, on his hands and knees, in between some pipes, some good-sized water pipes, and was hung up on a live circuit. Every, every one of us has a personal responsibility, and we make a decision at times if we're exposed to something, whether we either stop and help or we don't stop and help. So I looked down and I saw his belt, his leather belt around his waist. And, uh, so I reached down and I grabbed his belt and pulled him off the circuit. In a lot of cases these days, people are hesitant to act for many, many different reasons, okay? Uh, statistics bear out that most, most prevalently because they're afraid to do so. Caesar had already taken, um, he had already taken CPR, I think several times, uh, through his local. I was never expecting to help somebody else in, the, in a situation like this. He jumped right in and started doing the chest compressions. These two gentlemen did not turn a blind eye. How did you know throughout the years that you took this training that it was gonna bring you here today? It came together a lot better than I ever thought it would. All the times that I've taken training, I don't think I ever really wanted to use it. I think I was always afraid. 
you know, we're in Memorial Hall. It's, uh, it's named after, you know, the IBEW 134 members that uh, perished in the line of duty. And uh, I don't know if you noticed when you walked in today, there's a list of names on the outside of those members. It just seemed like the right thing to do. There didn't seem to be a choice. Our electrician's name would be on that wall if it was not for their efforts. They decided to help. That's the big adjective in training, deciding to help, not being fearful, because in a crisis situation, everyone reacts confused and disoriented. It's a race for time. Within four minutes, without oxygen, the brain starts to die. In Chicago and across the country, um, far too few people are equipped to save a life in an emergency. How many of you in the room know CPR? Good handful of you, great. We train CPR annually. Every superintendent in our company, every foreman in our company, every tradesman that wants to take it through Berglund is welcome every winter. With our company, they want to make sure that they have at least one to two people that are CPR uh, certified on the site, on every site. Um, but everybody should be trained. I could say I have that CPR training. Maybe I might not follow step by step, but the first thing I know what to do is secure the area and try and get that member out of harm's way or individual. Then call 911. Then administer the compressions. Pushed hard and fast at the center of their chest at a beat of 100 beats per minute. So you're probably thinking, what is that beat? We all know the song, Staying Alive. Yeah, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. That's how, yeah, everyone's laughing, but that's the beat that you do to save someone's life. Get somebody out at that site fence, get that paramedic into that individual with that AED ASAP. It's for all of us to have a call of action. Going out there and getting that CPR training knowing what to do, and then telling our stories. I never considered myself a hero. Um, I still don't. I see it more as just being in the right place at the right time. The main thing is Kevin's fine. I commend you both, commend your families. I'm glad you were, you know, obviously you're here today to celebrate with us. The laborers, the carpenters, the operators, everyone, the bricklayers, we've got a a solid group of guys that stick together. And Kevin would be in a much different place right now, and, and so would this local without him. If it wasn't for a few people in this room that got us on that path, like Don, Jim Conley of the Labor's District Council, Chuck Laverde, these are the guys that believe and understand how important training is to all of us. Now found in many public places, an automated external defibrillator uses an electric shock to restart a heart and cardiac arrest. So they'll rev their motors, beat on the side of the boats with baseball bats or pipes, and scare the Asian carp from where they were into the nuts. Keeping restaurants and hotels up to date with the latest design trends is a constant challenge. Finding qualified contractors isn't at finishingchicago.com. We work with top designers and general contractors who use the latest painting, drywall finishing, and wall covering techniques in Chicagoland's premier hotels and restaurants. The hospitality industry relies on finishingchicago.com as its free resource to find quality finishing contractors. For a great finish, start with finishingchicago.com. 24-7, IBEW Local 9 linemen are there protecting you and your family from the moment you wake up with the power in your home, on your way to work, lighting the way and easing congestion, plus keeping you safe with traffic lights and cameras. So the next time you're at a stoplight, pass under a power line, or just pull into your brightly lit neighborhood, think of your friends at IBEW Local 9. We'll continue to light the way for you. Meet us online at IBEW9.org. Along with the Army Corps of Engineers, the members of One Skilled Trade are working tirelessly to protect a great natural resource from an invasive species that, if gone unchecked, could bring about devastating environmental effects. Asian carp, they like to jump, especially in Star Brack Pool and further south on the Illinois River. There's places that you can go and they're just jumping out of the water like fireworks. They can cause a lot of damage. They can break bones, cause concussions, damage boat motors. They're definitely a hazard. The Asian carps are brought into the southern U.S. as part of the aquaculture industry. 
Rachel Carson wrote this book back in the 50s talking about the fact that we use so many chemicals in our environment that uh, we're killing off our frogs and our insects. So in the 60s and 70s, agencies brought in these fish to help clean the ponds, uh, make a healthier fish. And instead of putting chemical on the fish, we have one that's just raised with other fish. Unfortunately, big head carp, silver carp, those Asian carp species, the ones we see jumping out of the water, quickly get escaped into the environment. So Asian carp are highly voracious planktivores that outcompete our native species for food and space. We found our first ones in Illinois in 1986 on the Ohio River, on the Illinois River, and in 1990 we saw them up really in the upper Illinois River already. In the Mississippi River Basin broadly, we may have 160 or 180 invasive fish. Some of the biggest ones you may have heard of are things like uh, sea lamprey, the decimated lake trout populations, or zebra mussels really change the food web. So having another invader is not something we want to do. So the Illinois Department of Natural Resources introduced a new top predator. We are in the Hanson Material Services West Pit. It's a backwater lake, 500 acre backwater lake um, that's indirectly connected to the Illinois River. And we have three commercial fishermen out here that are contracted through the state that are removing Asian carp from these waters. They have gill and trammel nets and they lay the nets out in the water. Once the nets are laid out, the commercial fishermen will drive. So they'll rev their motors, beat on the side of the boats with baseball bats or pipes and scare the Asian carp from where they were into the nets. The commercial fishermen have grown up in Illinois fishing for things like catfish and buffalo. We have to kind of encourage them. The markets, the demand for these fish have been fairly low. None of the fish that we uh, catch are used for human consumption. They're used for fertilizer, lobster bait out in Maine, crayfish bait in Louisiana, uh, pet treats. Farther downstream, there is a commercial market, and it is for human food. They taste very good, like a cod, very light. It's not very fishy at all. So when we started this program in 2010, we were catching very large Asian carp, very large big head carp and silver carp. And as the program has progressed, we're actually seeing that the Asian carp have gotten smaller in size. In the last seven years, we've seen a 96% decrease in the relative abundance of those fish at the farthest uh, north populations. But the Illinois River is the gateway to the entire Great Lakes. And while human predation has cut the numbers dramatically, that's not enough for the Army Corps of Engineers. There are still a few survivors and over 150 other invasive species to contend with. You're always taught electricity and water don't mix. And you know, this is like, it, this is not your typical job site. We are at the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal Aquatic Nuisance Species Dispersal Barriers. Construction of the barriers was to install a steel billet electrodes 160 feet long at the bottom of the canal with cables coming up into the buildings connected to the pulse generating systems which basically pulses DC power into the water. The way it works is we do get our electricity from the local electrical utility. We then take that electricity and convert it from alternating current to direct current. Charges capacitor banks that are inside and then it sends that through the IGBT switches that basically allow, to basically sends however much power they need into the water at any given time. The electrical field in the water is actually constant from wall to wall, but it's, it varies from upstream to downstream and it's set up to peak in the middle. So as a fish is swimming into the electrical field, the farther it goes into the electrical field, the greater the shock it gets. Oh, well, it's just kind of like a, a cattle fence. As the fish gets closer, um, they'll turn around. Every once in a while, you'll get a fish that tries to make a run for it, and you see them basically fold up and float back south. It doesn't kill the fish because field strength in the barrier at, where at its peak is about 2.3 volts per inch. By that, we mean if we put in a voltmeter at that point with the leads about an inch apart, you'd read 2.3 volts. So the effective zappage is proportional to the surface area of the zappy. As long as you don't go in the water, you're fine, basically. If you and I were to uh, fall into the canal, these things can be deadly. We're much bigger than most of these fish. But uh, the fish is not a lethal barrier at all. As far as we can tell, it works. All of our monitoring has never detected any Asian carp right here immediately at the barriers. Native uh, species that we see challenging the barrier, we're watching them too to know how, if carp got here, how they would respond. You can sit at the end at 
right over by the bridge and you can actually watch the fish stop. In the trade, you met different kind of races, different cultures, different people, and now in the end, we all uh, the same family. When you have plumbing issues in your home, it can disrupt your whole routine. At Plumbers 911, we connect you with a highly experienced plumber in five minutes or less. We call it our five-minute promise. All of our expert plumbers are highly trained, background checked, licensed, and insured, so you can feel confident that your job will be done right the first time. Our phones are open 24-7 to help solve your problem, day or night, at 1-833-PLUM-911. Plumbers 911, your plumbing connection. We are DeWalt. We're the ones who grind it out. The ones using materials from all over the world to build the things that build America right here in America. And there's no place we'd rather be. Land of the free, tools of the brave. This is a team. It's made up of different players, positions, skills. Talented, sure, but on their own. Because every team needs a coach, someone who makes things work together. That's how less it works. We're coaches in the construction industry, bringing together laborers and management, unions and contractor associations. Our work leads to safer, stronger construction, which is a win for us all. It doesn't matter if your family came to the U.S. hundreds of years ago, during the early 20th century or in the early 2000s. The immigrant community has always been an important part of the skilled labor workforce. By building their community while on the job, these hardworking folks are able to build their own American dream. I was born in Mexico. I came to the United States in 1973. I was 17 years old. I was born in Mexico. I was a dentist assistant. And um, um, well, I have family that is in, they're in the trade. When I came in, the opportunities were amazing and a little bit intimidating because I had to learn a new language. It's very difficult. It's, it's very hard. Uh, you feel outcast it sometimes. Learning the construction language is a little bit different than the American language in itself. You know, it's a different language because of materials and stuff like that. I was one day just thinking like, if they can do it, I mean, why I can't do it? You know, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, uh, you know, the opportunities this council give for everybody. I had the chance to meet um, Alex and um, he helped me with the information how to get in. If they're not able to go to college for whatever reason, you know, the Carpenters Union is, is, is there for them. My name is Jose Pineda. I'm from Local 839. Local 363. Local 181. And I'm a first year apprentice. I'm a union carpenter instructor. I'm instructor on the Carpenter Training Center for the last 18 years. Acuérdense, máximo, 18. Siempre que sea posible, lo menos que se pueda. We don't judge nobody where they come from or how they speak. When I start teaching uh, on the Carpenter Training Center, I start teaching like for eight years just to Spanish speakers. We wanted the, every single member in this council feel like a, a brother. We have a lot of classes in school that they can pretty much take advantage of it. For example, OSHA in Spanish is, you know, critical for all the members to know about safety. Uh, advanced skill classes, you know, and uh, certi certified classes, you know, for all members. Pero el extinguidor, aquí. So they can be prepared to be able, I mean, to continue, I mean, his career as a carpenter all the way to the, all the way to the end, like myself. They believe the, the, the more professional we prepare the, 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 the guys in the school, you know, more professional work we make done. Entienden todos el español, me supongo, ¿verdad? Okay. The council, I mean, wants to make sure all members be informed in their own language. Every local has, has a meeting every month, and they're mostly in English. So Alex Perez comes out here on his Sundays 
and, and gives them some Spanish. The SWAT meetings give the opportunity, it's, it's an open forum for the people talking with us. They make a topic every single month. Quería empezar para dejarles saber de la clínica que está en Lyle. It's a different topic. Um, it can be like medical, it can be about investments. It is very important to the members that know there is a place that they can come in and pretty much ask that question that they're not be able to ask anywhere else just because there is a barrier in language. And the council understands their members' connections extend into their communities. Teaching our members is one thing that we do, but actually telling the public in general, you know. Some of the families go through and they see it because they relate to a union member, they really know what the union is, but trying to tell that to the public is a little bit different. For, for us, it's very important, you know, participate in this, in this event and, uh, and everything is related with the Mexican community. We got three or four generations in this council, and uh, with, the, with the Spanish community, we got the same. Well, in the trade, you met different kind of races, different cultures, different people, and now in the end, we all uh, the same family. We all carpenters, and we try to help each other. Telling my story to students, it really drives the, the point across. It's a privilege to be in the United States. Many people go through many, many ways trying to get the American dream. I am very proud of where I am right now, being a American Mexican. Some people, they, can, they, they don't get the chance that I had to be in this country and try to do something for a living, and I'm very proud. They got the opportunity to raise the kids, they send them to good schools, and, uh, and everything else because they, they, they canceled. I'm so proud because I, I grew up my family. I'm so proud that I have uh, one of my boys is, uh, <laughs> I'm so proud of him because uh, he's uh, with the Navy miles to be successful and to be to be somebody for my kids. That's all for this episode of Built to Last. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. And be sure to check us out on social media or on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You know, when I was a kid, my social network was called Outside. I would yell, watch Built to Last, watch Built to Last. I knew the show was coming.